Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome once again to the house of the Lord. Before we begin, just an announcement. Uh, for the first time in a very long time, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper during the service as we have in the past. And so we will invite you to come forward again, following the instruction of your usher as I, with the mask and gloves, baby steps, will distribute to you the bread and the wine. If you are not comfortable with this, and that is perfectly understandable, uh, after the congregation, we uh, dismiss ourselves after the singing of the final hymn. Please remain, and then I will invite you up personally to receive the supper. Then. We begin our worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. As we come today to worship our God, we must confess that we have not loved each other as he has loved us. It is important then that we confess these sins, not just to ourselves, but to God, and together find peace in his forgiveness. Here is the Savior. I have failed to follow your example of love and do not deserve to be called your friend. I have broken your commands in thought, word, and deed and do not deserve to be called your child. I deserve only your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I have seen the extent of your love in your life and death, and I look to you for forgiveness. Greater love has no one than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life to make us what we did not deserve to be, his friends and his family. In view of his sacrifice and by his authority and command, I forgive you all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our first hymn, This is My Lord.
ask for prayer. O oh God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, God, the Son, redeemer of the world, God, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide, a holy, blessed, and glorious trinity, three persons in one God, have mercy on us. Remember not, O oh Lord, the sins nor the offenses of our youth, but spare your people whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Spare us, good Lord. From all spiritual blindness, from pride, vanity, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, from all lack of charity, from all deadly sin, and from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, from all false doctrine, heresy, and division, and hardness of heart, and contempt for your word and your will, good Lord, deliver us. By your bitter grief, your cross, and suffering, your precious death and burial. Good Lord, deliver us. And the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, and by the proclamation of the kingdom. Good Lord, deliver us. By your mighty resurrection, your glorious ascension, and by the coming of your Holy Spirit. Good Lord, deliver us. Govern and direct your holy church. Fill it with love and truth, and grant it that unity which is in accordance with your will. Enlighten all ministers with true knowledge and understanding of your word, that by their preaching and living they may declare it clearly and show its truth. Bless and keep your people, that all may find and follow their true vocation and ministry in your kingdom. Hear, Hear us, the Lord. Grant us true repentance. Forgive our sins and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your Holy Word. Then, in our times of trouble, as well as in our times of prosperity, in the hour of death, and on the day of judgment, hear us, good Lord, and deliver us. Amen. Please be seated. first lesson for today is taken from Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 14 and is the account of the first Passover and God's regulations for his people to observe to remember the deliverance from Egypt but also to look ahead toward that promise of deliverance from death itself. Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month and the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night that they are, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. A lasting day. This is God. We join now in reading responsibly 
the words of Psalm of Isaiah 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and endured us our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson for today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, where Paul reflects on the blessing that is ours in the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is God. We join in singing our next hymn, it was on that dark, that doleful night.
Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of Scripture we're going to consider and celebrate today is taken from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again, I will drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is God's word. One portion of Scripture that we'd like us to begin considering, where Jesus says to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this supper with you. Eagerly desired to eat this supper with you. It's hard to know fully or to grasp fully what was in Jesus' heart, the depth of his love. But the, the Passover was a very special thing for so many reasons, something that he had instituted way back, back in the days of Moses. And it was special for many reasons. One, it was because this was the night on which God was going to bring about that final deliverance, bringing a terrible plague upon Egypt, both Egypt and the Israelites, when he would kill the firstborn son of every family. But he also promised that by sacrificing a lamb or a goat and painting that blood over the doorpost, he would trade the life of that lamb for the life of the son. And so the sons would be spared. And the people would be delivered from Egypt. So for that reason alone, it was a very special celebration for these people. A, a huge part of their history. <clears throat> but even more, it was a celebration of the picture that was represented in that sacrifice. For God had made another promise. That the soul who sins is the one who will die. And that's all mankind. But he made another promise in addition to that, that he would send a lamb would be punished instead, and whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Passover was not just a remembrance of the past, but it was a picture of the future, a picture of God's love for his people. And, on a lesser note, but as still a very special note, this was a time in which people got to celebrate these great truths with the ones that they love, with their family and with their friends. And Jesus here says, too, I have longed to eat this with you his 12 friends. Why? I think why? Why would he want to eat with, with these people? Um, let me explain. This was a dinner with his family, a dinner with his friends, and I've had many dinners with family. I'm talking about when I was a kid, and maybe you can relate to some of this. Forgive me while I share some personal remembrances. Family dinners. We used to have these a lot. Um, for whatever reason, my parents always had us have dinner together. We would all sit down around the table. And mind you, there was seven kids and, and two adults. And so it was a full table. Whenever we were there, it was a full table. And I remember being the youngest thinking, this is great, for about five minutes. And then, oh, I could really take up your time with stories. But there were the ones, you know, Maybe you know the ones, the ones who were incredibly sarcastic, the ones who could make you laugh at yourself and cry at the same time. The ones who were just mean, the ones who were kind, but of course the mean ones, the voices always are, are louder, and that's the ones you remember. There was the ones who were subtle and hit, hit you under the table, but do you know how it works if somebody hits you under the table and isn't caught, and you hit back? You're the one who gets caught. And, and of course there was my mom at the one end who was trying to control all of this, um, very gently, very lovingly, and then there was my dad at the other end who, who, who stepped in once in a while, but when he did, it was less subtle. And he had this ring that if you were within arm's reach, you would get it on the top of the head. And if you laughed, if it wasn't you, then you would get it from said brother later. This, this was dinner. And uh, I remember asking, if not verbally, I can't remember in my heart, can I just have dinner in my room? 
No, it was not allowed. Why? Why would my parents want to have dinner with us? I get it now. They didn't see us through our own eyes. They didn't see us through the eyes with which we saw ourselves or each other. They saw it through the eyes of a parent, through the eyes of love. I get that now. So even if there were, hypothetically speaking, bickering and arguing, you want your family around you. Because you see them with your eyes. And this is how Jesus saw these men. Jesus didn't see them with their eyes. He saw them with his eyes. Boy, if he had, though, if he had seen them with their eyes. Well, let's just kind of work, work, walk around that table and consider how conversations like that might have gone. You know, Jesus and his friends were very close, very close for three years. And you know, as well as I do, that familiarity often breeds contempt. The more time you spend with somebody, sometimes things get ugly. And while I'm sure there was joking and laughter and fun, there was probably some, some ribbing that might have begun easily at first, simple, or honestly at first, uh, that might have escalated. Oh, do you remember that time on the sea when, uh, oh, Matthew, you were so afraid because the storm came up, you know, you've never been on a boat before. And then Matthew goes, well, I saw you trembling too, Peter, and you're a professional fisherman. And maybe it came back and got a little more pointed. Well, Matthew, where was it that we picked you up again? Well, that's right, you were a tax collector, weren't you? And then maybe Matthew came back and said, well, that's because you weren't smart enough to be a tax collector. You had to be a fisherman. Or remember that time, Peter, when, um, oh, you thought you were so smart, and you told Jesus that, no, he's not going to go to Jerusalem, and he said, get behind me, Satan. That must have stung, huh? Well, maybe at least I had the, the guts to speak. You know, I'm making a lot of this up, and perhaps it's wrong. Perhaps it never got to that point, but you know that it can, Right? When you're surrounded by the people that you love, sometimes things can get pretty ugly. And we know that there was bickering because at the beginning of this dinner, Jesus calls them on it. They were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. The greatest fisherman? The greatest tax collector? No, probably not. The greatest person? The greatest friend? The greatest disciple? And Jesus calls them on it. And he, he, he shows them their sin by, first of all, washing their feet, showing them their arrogance is misplaced, but doing it in love, showing them that he still loves them. And then later on in the dinner, calling them out, saying that one of you is going to betray me, and all of you will run. And ask the question, why? Why would then Jesus want to have dinner with these 12 people? Well, it's because he saw them through his eyes and not through their eyes. He saw them through the eyes of a father who loved his children. Now, does that mean that Jesus was blind? He was blind to uh, their arrogance, their foolishness, their sin? No, not at all. He saw this more clearly than any of them. But he saw this through new eyes. You can look at things two ways. You can look at things the old way, or you can look at things the new way. And um, perhaps more doctrinally accurate, you can look at things through the Old Covenant, and you can look at things through the New Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant is something that's very easy to spot. We see it all the time. The Old Covenant is when we, when we see the flaws in one another, you know, those things that we might bring out when we're angry. Do you remember when you did this to me? It's sometimes hard to see in ourselves. It's very easy to see in one another. It's when somebody else breaks a rule, breaks a law, because that is the Old Covenant. It's a law. The Old Covenant began with that first law, the law that God gave to Adam and Eve. Do not eat from this tree. You have a perfect life with me, but if you want to disobey me, you will throw that away. You will die. They ate and they died. The Old Covenant was reiterated many times through God's people, finally chronicled through Moses. And he said to the people, if you will be my people, you will obey my commands, and I will be your God. But they didn't, and they died. This is the old covenant that these 12 men understood very well. 
when you said this one thing, Peter, or when you did that one thing, Matthew, or when I did this and you did this, the wages of sin is death. That's the old covenant. Jesus saw these things. He saw these things just as clearly as anybody at that table. But it's here when he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, the new covenant. What is the new covenant? The new covenant went, went, was first spoken almost immediately after Adam and Eve ate that fruit and understood what death would be. The new covenant was what God said when he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, Satan, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush you. He will crush your head. He will crush your authority to accuse. And you will strike his heel. It was the promise of forgiveness promised that God would not see what was done that day. He would only see his child. It was the same promise that, that God continued to give to his people in, in, the, in the picture of the Passover. When all people were supposed to die because the soul who sins is the one who will die, but God will bring someone else to this world. And his death will set you free. Your life will be traded for his. The new covenant in Jesus' blood is that promise that this very blood, which soon would be spilled, would be the blood that would buy back humanity. More to the point, the blood that would block, the blood that would buy back you. And because he was able to do this and know that this was what, what, what God had promised and what was about to happen, he's able to look at his, his, his people on this table and not see their guilt. Not see their, their wrongs, their anger, their hypocrisy, but to see perfection. Because the anger and the hypocrisy and the guilt he was going to deal with in a few short hours. I'm going to read you another passage. It's a beautiful passage. They're all beautiful passages. But this one to the point. This one taken from Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. God displayed Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. God did this to demonstrate his justice, since in his divine restraint, he left the sins that were committed earlier unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that he would be both just and the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus. Did God not see the sins of the people? Yes, he saw the sins of his twelve. He saw the sins of all humanity, but he promised that he would deal with them later. Much as the same way as, and perhaps you've been here too, when your, your mother will say, wait till your father gets home. And you're not being punished right now, but you know it's coming. For Adam, for Eve, for Cain, for all the people, and for these twelve, God says, we will deal with these sins, we will deal with them later. And later would be in a few short hours as Jesus hung on the cross. And then the Father would deal with sin, definitively, once and for all. But it is for that reason that Jesus does not see the sin in his people any longer. He looks at his people and sees them through the eyes of a father who sees no wrong, who only sees his child. And that is what makes this such a beautiful night. And we understand now why Jesus said, I have so longed to eat this with you. To spend this time with his children. It's a beautiful picture. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci, it's a little bit of history, painted this picture, and uh, some would argue, well, they didn't have chairs. They sat on the floor, regardless. A picture of, of, of his friends around them, all whispering and talking and perhaps even arguing, but Jesus in the center who loves his children looking on them with love. Now, in all due respect to <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, much greater painter, inventor, architect, all of the above than I, he got this wrong. And it's not just the chairs. I hope you see that. When you see this picture, I hope you see yourself there. Gathered around the table of your God, because there is no place where he would rather be than sitting with you, holding you, loving you, seeing you with the eyes of a father. Why? Why would he want to sit and eat with us? We who so often bicker and argue and fight and pick because he sees us through his eyes. 
I pray that we will always see this for ourselves. See the eyes with which he sees us and that he may allow us to see each other through those eyes. For this is his command. Love each other. As I have loved you, love one another. And by this, all people will know you are mine. Amen. Now may this peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with our final reading of Passion History as Jesus ascends to death. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Peter is here, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore I will punish him and then release him. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate said to them, It is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, the king of the Jews, who was called Christ? Pilate knew it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, because I have suffered a great deal today in a dream to account of him. The chief priests and the elders stirred up the crowd and persuaded them to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ, the one you call King of the Jews? Crucify him, they shouted. Crucify him. For a third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty, therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. And their shouts prevailed. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace of the governor, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head, put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of them, him worshiping. They spit on him, struck him in the face, took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. They mocked him, began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Once more Pilate came out and said to them, Look, bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. You refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You have no power over me that was not given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you was guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the pa of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, Pilate granted their demand, wanting to satisfy the crowd. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. He said, it is your responsibility. 
And all the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and had Jesus flogged. Then surrendered Jesus to their will to be crucified. The soldiers of the governor took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Here ends our reading of the Passion History. We join now in confessing together our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and then became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We join in singing our next hymn, Draw Near and Take the Body of the Lord.
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And I invite you to come forward and receive the supper of your Lord following the instruction of your usher. Lord God, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. Do not forsake us, but rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we willingly serve you day after day. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, hear our prayer. Amen. For our final hymn, we close with that blessing given to Jesus, given by Jesus to his friends, given to us in John chapter 14. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. We continue with our final hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? 